Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. My name is Andy Green, and with me, the one and only Felix Schultz. How are you, Andy? Uh, evil Schultz. Uh, I'm hey, good. Hey, hey. <laughs> I'm not evil. I'm it's just misunderstood. <laughs> You're a dynamic character with flaws like the rest of us. Uh, Do you know who would fit very well into a Jason Heaton novel? Who? Today's guest. Damn, that is uh, that is a good. That is a very good call. Who's the yeah. guest? Mike Horn. Mike Who's Mike Horn? Horn? Mike Horn is a uh, he's a professional explorer and adventurer, I suppose. He's also a long-term Panerai ambassador, which is how I got to be chatting to mm. him over a Zoom call during Watches and Wonders. Very so strong a- jawline, if you've not seen a picture of Mike he's, Horn. He's, he's got some of the old charisma about him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he's got some he's, gumption. Yeah, he's pretty... He's, he's had a fascinating life, and we sort of dig into a few few bits of that and, you know, talk about his role with Panerai and... What he thinks about uh, the polar ice caps melting, just for some light alternative conversation topics. So, you want to know yeah. a cool story about my corn? I, I, I mean, listen for another fifteen minutes and you'll hear something. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know if you, ta- I don't know if you talked about this, but yeah, being an explorer is an expensive, uh, it's an expensive hobby, an expensive job. You basically spend. But the story goes: when he was in his twenties, he made a lot of money in South Africa uh, selling cabbages. Cabbages. Yeah, cabbage wealth. Uh, right, he's got that cabbage cash. <laughs> cabbage secured. Green. Got yeah. The green. And that's that's allowed him to uh, to to become the explorer that he is today. So there you go. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's a fascinating life, and I, I've you know this is a bit of a diversion from, from yeah. where we're going. I find the economics of it really interesting. Mm. Like, um, you know, obviously there's sort of like the commercial tourism stuff that's part of it, and he's got deals with I know Mercedes as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, how do how does how do you say, look, I'm gonna you know walk across the set of the North Pole, and that's gonna be my life, and people are gonna pay me for it? Is it? That's amazing. And it's the time as well. Like you're spending a huge amount of time training, but also like some of these expeditions take you know months and years. It, yeah, you're just not making any income. So yeah, well, but you book deals, you're you know. Like, yeah. Anyway, it's. Um, <laughs> Fascinating. I find it fascinating, Andy. Uh, but before we talk to him, it's mm. maybe uh, let's let's have a quick chat about some of Panerai's highlights from the old Watches and Wonders. Did you catch any of them? I did. I did. I haven't uh, given them as much attention as, as some of the other brands, but there was there was one or two that really jumped out at me. Yeah. Um, the new Bronzo is probably a good place to start, Felix. Yeah. I mean, I I just there's only two that I want to talk about, Andy. Oh, they're the okay. Mo- the, but you like. There are other ones like that. Bronzo is very nice. So, what's going on with that, Andy? The uh, the submersible Bronzo Blue Abyssal. Uh, so, I think this is the first time they've done that. You know, iconic Bronzo model in the smaller case that the yeah. sub forty two forty two, yep. which makes it uh, very very wearable and very attractive. And it's sort of it's interesting. The Bronzo had so much hype around it, and it was one of those really hypey watches for for such a long time. And then, yeah, it seems sort of went a little bit quiet. And, and it's back with a bang, and it's a, looks it's a good looking watch, blue strap, blue dial, and obviously the bronze case in a very wearable proportions. The forty two mil Panerai's are great. Mm. I think that's 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 really exciting. The the ones that that I you know so Panerai, I mean the the new releases. There's no real surprises in terms of the case shapes, mm. really. Uh, that's sort of what defines them. But what I found really really interesting were two new releases one of them which is a little bit more commercial and the other one's a concept watch Mm -hmm. um the panerai e-steel the Mm -hmm. luminal marina e-steel and the e-lab uh which are substantially recycled watches so that the concept one is an Mm e-lab and 98.6 percent of the materials of the watch by weight are recycled So the titanium, I believe, uh, case has been recycled. Mm -hmm. The dial, the Superluminova is like recycled. The strap, it's all, you know, repurposed materials, which I find really interesting. Uh, Yeah, Yeah, very cool. Even the sapphire crystal, the hands, uh, yeah, most most components contain it. So that's, yeah, it's really cool. And this one, this one's quite interesting because it does say eLab, you know, so it's the eLab ID, but it does have it on the... um, Yeah. On the crown, is it the crown pin on the crown lock and on the dial, which is a yeah. pretty bold move. 
Well, it's like so. Pan and I do these concept sort of things, and I think this is the like it's like a concept car. Like you know, mm. I don't think they have a, a commercial saleable pieces on the on these yet, but they also. Um, it's more about sort of the statement to the industry and they yeah. publicly note every supplier. Like, you know, wow. the silicon came from Siltronics, you know, and Sigatech and like all this sort of stuff that you never see, but they're sort of shining a light on that. And hopefully, I suppose, you know, other brands will go, yeah, maybe we will reuse some components. And Well, you, you say know, that, but it's also on the Luminor Marina E-Steel, has E-Steel on the dial. Yes, and that is because so this is yeah that's so this is the one that you can buy yes. and it's not quite ninety nine point nine nine or whatever it was percent recycled. It is fifty eight point four recycled materials of mm-hmm. you know of the total weight, which is uh, a bit. I mean, on on the one hand, and we, I talk about this with Mike Horn. Like on the one hand, this is a luxury watch that costs you know thousands of dollars, and it's it weighs. 100 grams and, mm-hmm. and 50 grams of that, you know, steel or whatever it is, 89 grams of the material is recycled. Yep. Does that make a difference? You know, you're not, the, those 89 grams might not change the world, but I think it's uh, the mindset of it. That, yeah, of sustainability. Yeah, of, sort yeah. of choosing a supplier that uses the, you know, that supplies which, the recycling. In which case, yeah. I think that having it on the dial is super important, mm. you know? Um, but the, these are the ones that I think really, really good at sort of Panerai sort of putting their, their money where they're, you know, environmental policy is, and they're they're putting it front and center, and they're really pushing it forward. So I know other brands do it, but I think, uh, yeah, I think Panerai should really be rightfully applauded for it. Yeah, I think that it stand out from the um, probably dozen or so releases that they had. There's probably 15 watches that they dropped, uh, yeah. which is cool. Yeah, good on you. Yeah, Panerai. and I, I, and besides that, I think though that eco titanium look, especially with the bezel, that sort of. Uh, it's not like a ceramic insert or a mm. coloured insert. It's just matte on matte. I think it's a hot look. It actually so. looks really cool with that sort of light um, baby blue sort of Yeah, it's a, it's sort a good look. Contrast. Yeah, I uh, like it. I like yeah. it. So that's me on Panerai. Um, you know, it's pretty great. <laughs> awesome. Well, <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> in, the, in the spirit of um, expeditions, I, I ran an Instagram poll just uh, just recently and I asked a few questions because, uh, you know, you, you have those like in the shower moments where you start to contemplate, you know, life. Where's this going? <laughs> and I was just, you know, I'm seeing some prices of watches going at, at Philips specifically recently. Mm. And, you know, like a, a Panda Daytona from like 2019 sold for 40,000 Swiss francs, which plus oh. fees is like 60,000 70,000 Australian Man, dollars like it's just list. it's just mental and you, I'm looking at you know the the Patek you know and the 5711s and some of the the precious metals some of the you know the complications and just the prices where it's four or five times the retail price now and I've had you know I guess I've had friends um you know pick pieces up like I had a mate pick up the Aquanaut uh, Chrono which is you know the steel Aquanaut rubber strap and it was just abs- this hugely controversial piece and you know you can buy it at retail which is probably like forty four thousand dollars and yep. then i was i knew that they were going for a lot but i looked on chrono 24 and the prices were like 180 190 thousand dollars which to me is just insanity absolute insanity and it got me thinking to get this watch at retail you know obviously everyone knows that you get these certain watches and you're kind of gifted equity in a sense it's like you know you buy it and mm-hmm. you can x times your money instantly if you were to choose to but having friends that have got these watches and, you know, having got some hot watches myself, it's not easy. It's very difficult on, on many fronts. And I just kind of, I got, got thinking of like, what is the point of spending all that money? And, and first of all, being able to afford it. Second of all, being able to get it to then not actually enjoy it. And, and Felix, you know me, I, I scratch my watches basically the day I get them. There's a, there's a scratch or a ding. And it's always <laughs> the worst. And, I'm, and I've been like wondering, like, is it just me? Am I the only person who you know, scratches up his GMT master or his OP. It's like the day I got my pink, uh, my candy pink Oyster Perpetual, I scratched it. And I was like, yeah, classic Andy. Like I just hit things. I'm, I'm just clumsy. But I, I thought it can't just be me. Like yeah, other people must hey, be out there. Before, before we get into the poll. Yeah. I was, well, how do you, does it bother you that you scratch it? The, f- the f- It's the first one. Yeah. Um, it's all like when you get a new car and you, you notice the first like rock chip or scratch. Yeah. And then you kind of remember that you bought it to use it and 
you kind of get over it. Like it's never, if I do it from something that's me being a bit clumsy or not paying attention, I get annoyed at myself because I could have avoided it, but I don't, yeah. I don't get angry about it because it's, to me, it's like the clasp on my, on my BLNR is, there's no polish left on it. Like it's just scuffed and scratched and that's but, why but I got that's, it. It's not because you went out on the town, got mad hammered and decided to do parkour over gravel. No, no, no. no. And I, like, I put a ding in the, in one of the lugs when I hit it, you know, on a, on, I think it was like a towel rack or something, and the towel rack was absolutely fine, but the the lug had a little dent, and I was like, <sighs> yeah, it's actually an oyster steel towel rack. With, <laughs> it's uh, stronger than nine hundred four L. That's for sure. Coating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so it's no, I'm, I I don't I wouldn't deliberately like scratch a watch, but to me it's sort of it's part of the wear. And the other yeah. thing is for modern like the vintage watches I own, they're already scratched to hell. The new stuff, there's not much they can't you know that fix they can't fix or replace so if it's what about this is sorry continuing down this path say you've got like you had a vintage sub or mm. a, you know tudor it's got a nice bezel that would be or a crystal that's hard to replace yeah um and you put a big old whack on that like say it was the bezel and you you scratched some of that aluminium yeah i'd be i'd be annoyed if it was something that was you know borderline irreplaceable or all correct I'd, but I, I don't tend to to own vintage pieces like yeah. that too much. I, sort I guess of, you're probably not wearing it while you're, you know. That's sort of the beauty of, of vintage. Those, you know, the new old stock stuff that you'd be afraid to wear is ridiculously expensive. So it's not a problem I would have to have. Yeah. Um, would I, you know, say I got a, I don't know, a Pepsi at retail or a Daytona at retail, would I not, would I keep it pristine? There's there's just no way that I could. I'm, yeah. I'm not capable. Like I swear, and I say this to, to this is this is how I ended up at this point because I swear some shirts that I wear will scratch polished center links. Like it's, yeah, sure, the chainmail shirts. Yeah, you just look at it and it's and there's scratches and, and it's sort of like, oh, there's a new scratch. And again, I just I rest on the fact that I could always get it fixed, replaced, polished, refinished, whatever it is. What um, about, uh, do you change bracelets much yourself? A little bit, or, yeah. Or straps? Do yeah. you like tape the lugs? It doesn't really or, do too much. Like, do you, Or do you try and like... I try. I try not to. I try to either not change it or, but again, the back of the lugs doesn't bother me. But yeah, again, okay. I had a, I had a, I changed the bracelet and one of the spring bars shot out the front and like scratched the front of a polished lug. And I was like, oh, that's annoying. But then I only knew that it was there because I could see it. But also, I only know, I know how it happened. If you saw it, you'd yeah. think I've just like put it down on a table and scruffed it. So, yeah, it's just it's this constant thing of uh, I think about you know people that really are protective of their watches and, and manage to keep these things mint whilst wearing them, which you do see. Like I saw, you know, someone put up their favorite watch and they bought it five years ago and there's not a scratch or scuff on it. I'm like, how is this your favorite watch if you've kept it this pristine? I reckon I've actually got uh, quite a interesting perspective on this that is uncommon mm. because I, at one, simultaneously don't care and can care very much. Yeah. Because my own watches, I don't care. Yeah. Like, uh, I'll scratch it. I'll, I'll, I'll obviously not try and, you know, get scratches on them, but it, it genuinely doesn't bother me. And I'll change a bracelet and I'll be like, you know, after a, or a strap and I'll get a bit frustrated and I'll mm. just try and jam it in there and I'll end up with like marks all over the back. Um, but if I'm wearing a watch that is not mine, yeah. I'm very good with it. It's totally different. Like, yeah, same. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. Review watches, you have to be. Yeah, because it's, you know, you sign the paperwork and, you know, that you, you break it, you board it, essentially. Um, you know, I'll walk through walls or, you know, walk through doors with my hand or the watch face in, like, the small of my back. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? If it's, if it's gold or something like that. Terrified. Um, Sleeves over yeah. the top. And, 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 yeah, you know, and then the point where I end up is I sort of think, you know, I'm not saying people are buying watches to flip them or they're kind of are protecting the value, but for me it's like, where the difference between a slightly or, or you know an eight out of ten watch and a ten out of ten watch is not big enough for me to to carry that stress with me. Um, yeah. You know, say you get a Daytona and it's and it's a mint Daytona, uh, they're going for forty thousand dollars. If you wear it, it's still going to be worth thirty eight. Yeah, thirty eight, thirty seven, whatever it is, or it's thirty five, and then you just get it yeah. refinished with a Rolex service. You spend two grand, and then it's back to forty, and no one's ever going to know. And a lot of dealers do that anyway. So. That the actual cost of wearing your watches, even if you had that in mind, is not yeah. it's not that high. So what I did, Felix, was I actually asked people. They said, yeah, sure. "Do you have scratches on your watches?" And ninety five percent of people said they did. So there was like six hundred responses, which is pretty high for a poll for me. But that means like thirty people don't scuff their watches, and there's thirty people out there that are borderline psychopaths like this that just protect things. 
<laughs> um, I suspect no. we know 15 of them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I, I, well, I can see who they were. Um, so <laughs> they're all getting unfollowed. <laughs> um, Hello, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> and then I asked, does it bother you? Because I think that's the big question. Yeah. And some of the responses were really interesting. A lot of them were kind of like, you know, like I said with the car, you know, it's like white sneakers, the first scuff is the one that hurts. Uh, you know, a lot of people sort of said it, their memories and, you know, it's sort of, you just get used to it. It's just part of owning it. And the rest, the, the first scratch is, is, is the worst. And then the rest yep. of history, some people were like very adamant with just saying, no, they prefer a scratched. Uh, some people did care. Some people say, yeah, no, they can be polished out. Some people, you know, had the same sort of, uh, I guess, view as you of sort of, if it's someone else's watch, then yeah, I'm very careful and it would, it would ruin it for me. But sort of a resounding no. Uh, sure. you know, one of my favorites was from uh, Ross Povey, Tudor Collector, who said it bothers me if they don't. Um, <laughs> so it's just an yeah. interesting, such an interesting thing. And I just, the reason it got me thinking was because you see these watches you got going at auction, you know, we're in the world of watches, we get them. And I just kind of think like, I don't know if I want to be the person that, and this is pretty uh, deep for you, Felix, but I don't want to be the person that, you know, I die in however many decades or years and my estate leaves behind like this mint watch collection and the people that get it go, oh, great. These are in like perfect condition. These are going to be so easy to sell. I'd much rather I left behind like well-worn watches. That they go, oh, I've got all these memories attached to them. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uncle Andy wore this here or he's worn this watch in every photo. Da, 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 da. And it's just a bit more like I'd much rather that than sort of leaving that pristine legacy behind. That's what would you rather have? Mm. Uh, would you rather have a let's say I don't know fucking mint Tudor mint Rolex Submariner from nineteen seventy two? Would you rather have new in box, you know, pristine, or one that's got like beautiful patina and you know tropical dial and all that? Which one would you rather own? I like the character. I like the character when it comes to the old stuff. I. I'm happy with if I choose something that's sort of original but has character over that mint and pristine look. Well, there you um, go. Even lately, I've been kind of drifting towards my newer watches because of the fact that I'm I know that I can get them fixed and polished up, and I don't have to stress as as much as the old stuff. So it's like it kind of for me, it's been this process of eliminating the the those sort of like little stresses of ownership, and the new stuff's perfect for it. You know, most cool. new watches are built really well when you don't have to worry about wearing them. And if you can afford to buy it, you can certainly afford to service it and replace some parts if you must. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I 100% agree. Um, well, stay tuned because Mike Horn's got a great Ooh. watch that he's uh, probably scratched. Put some dings in. Glad I got that off my chest. Um, <laughs> before we chat to him, uh -huh. change the topic because yeah. I've also been liking something. Which Is I'm, it a watch? <laughs> no. Uh, it's a Canadian country star by the name of Orville Peck. Um, oh. I'm sure you've heard of. Who is that guy? He's got uh, a, he's got the uh, the old fly curtain. Yeah, mask. he's a mystery. His identity is shielded by his fringe masks. Um, his real identity is actually not a hundred percent confirmed. There's speculation, uh, but it's it uh, it's a mystery. <laughs> I love you read you read up on it. It's like he's between the age of twenty and forty. <laughs> and, I love a good. Uh, this is a, this is not nothing to do with Orville Peck, but I love a good masked anonymous like daft punk sia all those yeah. that's great you just yeah. the anonymity is just amazing and he, he kind of says in interviews that it makes him freer having the anonymity because he can yeah, kind sure. of just be himself and he's got a great voice oh you know johnny cash vibes rory orbitson chris I isaac i don't know if you if you want a comparison um but i've been listening to him on uh on title are you on title felix no why would i be on title uh, they're not today's sponsor, but it's just a, it's just that next level of like audio <laughs> well, quality. Bigger than Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. But you know, you get a nice pair of pair of speakers to to plug in and or stream through, and Title does make a difference. So all the is, it, is on it title. Better, better audio quality is that the yeah, it's the it's much vibe? better. It's yeah. much better, and some of the artists upload like the master tracks. So Ooh. it's one of those annoying things where you tell yourself that it's not worth the money, or you won't notice a difference, and then. You kind of do it and I then... I do like Beyonce, though. Beyond, yeah. <laughs> well, I think Jay-Z was one of the like yeah, founding yeah, yeah. investors. Yep, yep. But yeah. Part owner, I think, unless he sold it. Anyway, enough of Orville Peck. Enough of scratches. We've got to take a quick little break, Andy. Let's do it. Today's episode of OT the Podcast is brought to you by Watchbox. Watchbox is the world's leading platform for the buying, selling, and trading of pre-owned luxury watches. Fueled by technology, innovation, and unmatched global experience in the high-end watch market. 
Hey, Felix, did you know that Watchbox own every watch that they sell? Nice. Yeah, it means they're not really a marketplace per se, and it means that they can implement universal standards across their global presence. They're also one of the largest buyers of pre-owned watches worldwide, meaning the selection on offer is amazing and ever-changing. Head over to their online store, thewatchbox.com, to discover the many hundreds. In fact, I just checked and there's thousands listed for sale with so many more in inventory. Watchbox have all the hot stock with brands like Rolex, AP, Patek Philippe. But that's not it. There's also a killer mix of truly special independent brands. You, know, you don't see them everywhere. Think FP Jean, Langer, Grubel Forse, even Richard Mill. They really have it all. There's also a lot of fun in the 100K you know, plus category. But regardless, there's always something new to discover. Anything catch your eye, Andy? Well, now that you mention it, there is an Everose Rolex GMT Master 2. Saru, that is really speaking to me. I'll drop a link in the show notes in case anyone's feeling generous. Look, uh, please do. Don't bother putting it in the show notes. I'll just buy it for you. Don't buy it all at once. <laughs> for our international listeners who want that in-store experience, Watchbox have a handful of salons in the USA, UAE, Singapore, Hong Kong, and naturally Switzerland. To check out their unmatched global infantry, head to thewatchbox.com. You'll literally be blown away. And when shopping at thewatchbox.com, you can enjoy guaranteed authenticity, two years warranty, and free express global shipping. And while you're at it, why not join the Watchbox community? On top of being one of the world's largest dedicated luxury marketplaces for watches, they are also very serious when it comes to content. Community is front of what they do. Felix and I can personally speak to the fun of Tim Mosso's Facebook group, for example, or subscribing to Watchbox Studios on YouTube, which has some ridiculously good content. From Tim Mosso to Mike Manjo's, Watchbox has enthusiasts at the core of their business. They've written some fantastic content on the website, things like historical pieces, really handy buying guides, and of course, industry news. So whether you're in the market for a new watch, looking to sell or even trade, hit up Watchbox today at thewatchbox.com. Buy world-class timepieces with confidence and convenience. Now let's get back to the show. And we are back. Andy, we've got to get, uh, well, we're not really getting Mike, Mike on the phone because I already said before that we recorded it in Watches and Wonders. So we've got to upload that file and plug it in, which is a lot less dramatic. But fair warning, this is uh, a Zoom. So mm-hmm. there might be a little bit of a little bit of a drop in audio quality or a bit of an abrupt start here or there. Uh, but Mike Horn as we sort of mentioned at the start, he's a South African-born professional explorer. He's been pretty much doing it full-time since I believe the late 90s when he... Mm. Sold his cabbage uh, business. Well, he did a bit, like he did, no, he did a bit earlier, like he sort of started, uh, you know, doing you know, mountain climbing and treks here and there. But then I think he went up uh, or down one, one way, uh, probably <laughs> down the Amazon in a canoe that was a fairly... Makes fairly sense epic trip and he's done you know pole to pole uh he's done arctos he's done a whole fascinating you know swathe of things and much of it that's been done with panerai so there have been quite a few limited editions that he's been associated with over the years um but he's he's a fascinating you know he's an explorer he's obviously a pretty much one of the most sort of alpha guys you'll ever meet but he's passionate about the environment and you know sustainability, and he comes at it from a really interesting place. So, uh, can't wait to share the chat with you all. I'm excited. Let's get him on. What what what's your screensaver or your the wallpaper you've got behind you? I, I've got the Golden Gate Bridge, and behind oh. the Golden Gate Bridge, you can't see my very very messy. Uh, home office. So uh, no, no, because you should have the the Sydney Bridge, no, the Sydney yeah, Harbour Bridge. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good uh, that's a that's a good cop. But it's uh, I think Australians have a bit of a different relationship with the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We've got it on all our tea towels, and uh, you know well, we, we we see enough of it. What about you? How how have you? Uh, where are you at the moment? Are you in Switzerland or? Yeah, I'm 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 back in Switzerland and. Um... Basically, just enjoying the, the springtime. You guys going into winter. We're going into spring. Nice. And, um, you know, with this uh, little COVID problem that we have around the world, it's been just the best time ever, you know, for 
<laughs> well, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a joke, but it's a good time to explore your home as, as much as you can, you know, like. Of course, of course, you know, it's, it's been, Felix, you know, it's, um, we've, we've been lucky in Switzerland not to be confined, uh, you know, um, it's winter and obviously Switzerland, Switzerland's known for skiing. It's, it's been really amazing. A lot of people been outside doing more activities than usual when they can go to restaurants and cinemas and stuff like that. They tend to connect, connect less to nature mm -hmm. and stay more indoors. But uh, this year has been really, really good for, for outdoor sports and, and, and adventure sports. Absolutely. So I wanted to speak a bit about your job because it's a pretty unusual one. What what does life as a professional explorer look like normally? Not yeah. not last year. <laughs> First of all, I th I think you know you you're born to be an explorer because it's a life that you spend a lot of time away from home. It's a life that you take extreme risks. Mm -hmm. It's a life. Um, that you often find yourself confined in a small tent uh, on the polar ocean or in Antarctica or at 8,000 meters or in the middle of the Amazon jungle. Um, it's a, it's a, a life of, of excitement because every day you go into a situation that you've never been before, seeing things that you've never seen before walking where you've never been before. And that kind of stepping out of your comfort zone is a little bit against what we try and create um, by setting, getting a good job, setting up a family uh, and a home uh, where we like the security um, that we build around us to be able to live the life that we would like to live. And we don't we don't have all of that as an explorer. Yep. So before you decide to become one, um, then you should know that, you know, you are going to be uncomfortable. You are going to be afraid. You might lose your life. And mm. if you're willing to accept that, then you've turned a switch in your head where um, the will to win and the will to achieve and the world the world to go out there becomes bigger than the fear of, of losing it. You know, so we're always afraid of losing what we create. And then that stops you from progressing. So when the world to win becomes bigger than the fear to lose all of that, that's when the life as an explorer really makes sense in a way. Interesting. Uh, the, the thing that I sort of find really interesting chatting to uh, chatting to you and like reading about other people that, that do these incredible, unusual things is what, what the sort of the purpose of it is. And I understand from maybe from someone's personal drive, but yeah. back in the day, it seems like exploring served a function to fill in the map. You were finding new things. You were, you know, looking for, you know, uncharted territories or, or whatever it was. Is that still the case today? You know, there, there's still a lot of places that we've mapped, but we've never been. And that is, that is what, what excites us, to be able uh, to take technology that exists because 200 years ago, um, explorers charted the world. They looked for Antarctica. Um, they, they had a purpose to go and establish life everywhere. And they wanted to, in, in a way, make their, their territory as big as they could, claiming land that mm -hmm. was never claimed. And there was a purpose behind it because it was government funded. Uh, these guys that were willing to go out there uh, taking these risks, uh, they were paid to do it. Now, as we evolved and technology evolved, we could do, we can do stuff today that wasn't possible to do 100 or 150 years ago. And that changed the nature of exploration, not discovering a new land, but obviously 
getting to know the details of the land that was discovered that people hardly live in. And for us as, as an explorer, um, it, it makes us extremely happy. And that's the selfish part of, mm. of being an explorer. Because if I'm at home, I want to be on the polar ocean in the Arctic. If I'm at mm. home, I want to be at 8,000 meters. And the moment I go out there and I'm at 8,000 meters or I'm in the North Pole or the South Pole or the middle of the jungle, that's where I'm the happiest. So ultimately, we find we find what makes us happy in yeah. life. Is that your home then? Like, is is that if you know if if you're happy in in the, the Arctic or on the ocean, is that where your home is? Beyond you know your your house in in, in Switzerland, Felix. I would say that's where I feel the most alive. That's where I'm. I'm happy at home. I'm happy surrounded by people, but I'm not necessarily feeling alive. Uh, every day at home and that feeling of being alive having a purpose doing what no other other guy in the world is doing gives you this this feeling of of accomplishing what you set out to do and i think although it is risky we don't think of dying we think of 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 living and that to us as explorers or anybody in being a journalist or being uh, a doctor needs to go out of his comfort zone to be able to learn to progress and and basically climb the ladder of life in a way so it is it is a job like any other job yep. maybe a job that not a lot of people would want to do but that allows us to yep. find this feeling of being alive one more thing, I, I, and this is sort of tying a little bit, starting to sort of your work with Panerai. You've been exploring the world sort of pretty consistently on a serious scale since the 90s, according to your Wikipedia yeah. page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, You've seen a lot of the world, like intimately. I suspect you've walked over more of it than, you know, anyone else really. How has it changed over the last oh, 20 years? Felix. Felix, in 30 years of exploration, I've seen the world change more radically and faster in the last 15 years than the, the first 15 years of exploration. And, and when I speak about changes, it's because I've gone back to the same places twice or three times. So you've got a comparison. And the world is a pretty small place if you think that I've sailed 27 times around it. I've walked physically three times around the world. I crossed Antarctica. I crossed the North Pole. I've been up to the, some of the highest mountains in the world. I swam down the Amazon. And I keep on going back to these places simply because the world is such a small place. Mm. And the moment you go back, and that, should, that, that going back would be 15 years later or 20 years later to the same locations, then you can see the change. So the polar regions to me shows the most change. In 2006, uh, when uh, I did the first winter expedition to the North Pole uh, with Borgi Ausland leaving from Russia, we arrived on the pole, on the North Pole, to see the sun rise for the first time above the equator. You know, the, in the winter, the sun moves south of the equator and you guys have your summer. And in your winter, the sun moves north of the equator and we have our summer. So going to the North Pole in complete darkness in 2006, when I reached the pole, we measured the ice on the mm. pole um, because we needed to make a landing strip for a Russian research plane. Mm -hmm. So the ice measured 2 meters 50 on the pole. Okay. Last year when I crossed 2019, well, not last year, the year be, it's about a year yeah, ago yeah. when I finished yeah. my North Pole crossing, um, the ice measured eight centimeters. What? Eight, eight centimeters. No, that's, so, yeah, wow. So, so those changes I've physically seen, but nobody else in the world has been there at that time. Nobody right. else. So the only guy to witness it in the world was 
was me and Borgi Ausland, uh, the Norwegian explorer that uh, crossed the pole with me. So those are those are unique, um, uh, basically information yeah, to be wow. able to say, listen, the the Arctic Ocean is busy changing. And if we think that we might not have ice uh, on, on the North Pole in 25 years in, from now in the summer, maybe we should rethink that again and think that maybe in the next 15 years, we might not have ice in the polar regions. Do you find that overwhelming? Wow. It's, 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 I think it's not overwhelming. It's, it's a sense of disappointment that I'm disappointed in the way that I kind of not lived my life. I don't regret it, but I'm disappointed that we as intelligent human beings can make so many mistakes that actually kills the mother that feeds us all, that mm. gives us this enjoyment that, that, and I'm not a tree hugger. I'm not somebody sure, sure. that, you know, I'm because I live, it's my playground. The world's my playground. Those changes when I saw a grizzly bear kill a polar bear. A polar bear is much stronger than a grizzly mm -hmm. bear. A polar bear is much bigger. A grizzly bear never came up into the polar regions. So they never they never, never met. Cross paths, yeah. So so now that the ice is so far up north, a polar bear can swim a hundred kilometers, but you can't swim 180 kilometers. You'll drown. So they, they swim out. They can't feed. They come back to the land completely weak and exhausted. Because of the heating of our planet, now the grizzly can find food higher up into the polar, in, into the, um, the circle, the polar circle. And they meet up. And it's two males. What do male, males do? We first thing we fight or we kind of, you know, <laughs> we, we want our territory. So, so basically um, that's, that's what, what I've seen. And then if you see drowned polar bears, why do polar bears drown? They, they are marine mammals. Yeah, yeah. They can swim a hundred kilometers. They drown because now before the polar region had ice, the Arctic, at ice. Now the ice has moved up north and you have wind. And when the wind blows over the water, it creates waves. So before there was no waves. Yeah, wow. It was wind blowing over ice and the ocean stayed, ca stayed calm. A polar bear never sw swims in waves. So they get tumbled in those waves, they, which now you find in the polar regions. And why do I know I find it? Because I can see the erosion in the yeah. permafrost at the continent's edge. So nobody's so, seen it, but I've walked around the world to see it and witness it. So my, my, my question is, I guess, like we're here, you know, we're here, we're here talking about your life and your, your work, but also about Panerai. And this year, I think Panerai's had a really, and the last few years, I mean, uh, that 2019 uh, the Titanium Watch, uh, that, that you worked with them on, but they're so now they're doing a lot of recycled, you know, steel and materials, a whole kit and caboodle. And obviously, these are you know expensive luxury watches. What does this sort? What does sort of does this recycling say to consumers and to corporate partners about the importance of sustainability? Felix, I, th I think first of all, just to I'm, I think I'm a bigger problem to Panerai than, than actually an asset. Um, and I don't know why they still support me after 21 years, because each time I go to them, um, it's, I'm not the luxury type of guy. I'm not, um, I don't need a lot. I just need things to work. And when I, um, I was changing the, the rudder shaft of my boat after 27 circumnavigations of the world. Mm -hmm. That rudders that steered that boat out into the world of exploration and back safely home um, meant something to me. And when I, when I took it out to change it, 
I I was standing there with the piece of stainless steel about this thick, that stock of the rudder. And I said, but this, this piece of metal has played such an important part of my life mm. and the life of science and the life of education uh, and the protection of, of, of our planet. I can't just throw it away. It's, it's got a story to tell. So straight away, I looked at my watch and I said, but it's stainless steel. It's the same material. They, they make um, components of the watch from. And I called up Jean-Marc and, uh, uh, and I said, listen, um, you've got to recycle this. You've got to make watches out of this metal. Yeah. And Straight away, he was the right person to speak to because he said, wow, you know, this piece of metal's got a true story to tell. And if I can take this metal and not buy new metal and mining and all of that, that get cycle. going, yeah, cycle, and I can recycle it and, 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 and make watches of it. It's unique. And it's, that, that to me was the problem that I gave to Panerai. And they could have easily come to me and said, listen, Mike, fuck, making five watches out of that just, piece of shit is, is just not cost effective. But because it's the luxury good um, segment, that's where changes can be made because it's, it's afforded. You can afford it. Mm -hmm. Why do we use plastic? Because it becomes cheaper. It's for, for the people that earn less and, and, and can afford stuff that they can't afford if it's too expensive. So if this can be done, that's where the changes should be made by people that can afford to invest in the future of our planet. Yeah, and I've always thought that the way to change changing the the perception around you know the environment and the world you're going to get much further you know help convincing people that run large corporations than you know people on the street you know they're the ones that can maybe uh do something a little bit more effective exactly exactly so so i think that we we've got a um a responsibility each individual that lives on this planet we have a responsibility towards nature or the or, or the earth or the mother that actually feeds us so if we can um give things a second life then why not absolutely so but but the image that we have is as soon as we we think it's no longer um like i i had to change the rudder stock because otherwise i might end up losing a rudder sure. and metal fatigue and stuff like that. So the moment that we, we change it, we think it's garbage in our mind. It's, yep, you've yep, got to yep. throw it away. But it's not garbage. It can be used for something else. And that's where the second life has become so important. Nature cannot sustain and give us more um, natural resources than what it can because the planet is limited and we, we 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 are in debt already towards the planet and like i said i'm not a greenpeace i'm not a wwf uh, and i don't sit there and 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 just i'm just realistic about what i see in nature Absolutely. Now, I know you've got to probably go to another interview in a few seconds. I just got one more question for you. Uh, yeah. And I, I want to see how this goes. What, over your 20 years, 20 plus years of wearing Panerai, what is something that you've done with a watch that's taken it above and beyond telling the time? What is it? When have you really relied on uh, a Panerai? You know, I... I... I once uh, wanted to ski a face, a steep face, very close to where I live. And the conditions had to be very special. So very strong winds from the south that would blow humid snow and rain onto the rock face, that it would freeze to the rock face, that I could 
ski on a very thin layer of of snow mixed with ice stuck to the face. Sure. So otherwise it's just a rock face. So that happened. So I went up, climbed up late evening, and in my car I forgot. Um, we call it a piton. It's something that you. It's a metal metal bit you be hit into because there's a there's a part of it that I needed to I needed to abseil with the rope. Sure. When I looked in my bag, I forgot the pitons in my car. The only thing that I could put into the crack was my Panerai. Put the the watch in a crack like this and turn it sideways so now it can't come out. Put the rope around the watch and abseil down. So I lost my watch. I never went back there to find it. But, you know, when I asked Panerai to give me the watch, a, another watch, because, um, you know, they they don't just give me the amount of watches. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, yeah, they yeah. give me one maybe every <laughs> five years or whatever for all the expeditions. Um, yeah, they said, well, that's a bullshit story. You know, what really happened <laughs> to the watch? But then we had the, because my I was stuck on the face and I didn't, the helicopters had to come out or my wife called the helicopters because I kind of disappeared. I left her a note and said I was going to try and ski this face that was never cool. done. And so the proof was there. And uh, then they gave me the other uh, watch. But so you had you to know, prove it. Yeah, you, you have to prove it. Better right. They don't give watches. <laughs> so is it, is it still out there or has someone picked it up? It's still out there. It's still okay. out there because nobody has gone has gone back. And I think it's kind of a um, it's it's an interesting um, it's Testament. an interesting story because somebody's going to find it someday, and I bet you it's still working. That's but, amazing. But but then I then I burned my tent one day when I did that expedition around the world following the the Arctic Circle, and the watch the watch was. Um, in my jacket pocket and I got into the tent. I take the jacket off and changing the fuel in my stove. Um, I didn't see the pilot light of the stove that was still alight and some fuel because the, the, um, the, um, the, the, the gas of the fuel, when you open it up, it ignites yep. and everything burned. And the only thing that I found was, watch. was my watch, but melted into the ice. And that watch is in the, the Museum of Panerai in Italy. That's in cool. Well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing what they can, uh, what they can handle. So, um, Mike, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you about, you know, your travels, uh, watches and, and the environment today. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your day in lovely Switzerland. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you in person soon. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've been there five or six times with my boat. So I'll be back there in Sydney soon. Right. Thanks a lot, Felix. Thank you, Mike. Felix, that was uh, fantastic to kind of hear from Mike. And thank you, Panerai, for, for hooking that up. Jealous yes, I wasn't indeed. there. Yep, we'll have to get him. Uh, it'd be cool to see him in Australia one time. Like Maybe when that's... You can canoe down. <sighs> yeah. He's got a boat. He's got, as we've heard, he's got his boat, which he turned they he turned it into a watch. He gave them the you know the bit of the boat and said, "Make it into a bloody he watch." He did. He did. And that uh, the, that watch story, just replacing the uh, the we'll, old hiking equipment. Dangerous. We'll just, uh, we'll just find that. In, apparently, it's still there. Who knows? <laughs> Future collectible one day. All right, Felix. Well. Thank you to Watchbox for sponsoring today's episode. As always, check out thewatchbox.com to see their great range of timepieces. If you want to email us, otthepodcast at gmail.com. Ot.podcast on Instagram if you want to DM us or, you know, share your exploration panel stories. Fantastic. And if you like Ot, tell your friends, subscribe, five-star reviews. Uh, yeah. Five stars only. But only five stars exclusively. We'll see you guys when we see you. Bye.